To my left, I have Naomi Ballantyne, who has built three of the largest life insurance companies in New Zealand. She is the first woman to found two insurance companies, including Partners Life, which she is currently the founder and, sorry, the general manager of, yeah. managing director of, <laughs> which she sold last year in 2022 to the Japanese life insurance company Daiichi for $1 billion. <laughs> to her left, we have Alexia Hilbertito, the founder and CEO of Girlboss New Zealand. Alexia has built a network of nearly 18,000 strong young women to move confidently into STEM subjects. She founded Girlboss at age 16 with the mission to close the gender gap in science, technology, engineering, maths, leadership, and entrepreneurship. Alexia. <laughs> And to complete this trio is Cindy Palo Cohn, all the way from the US. <laughs> she is the current, current and first female president of USA Soccer. <laughs> and it's so great to see so many USA supporters in the room today. Agreed. Cindy played for the national team from 1996 to 2004, winning the World Cup in 1999 and two Olympic gold medals in her career. She's coached at Collegiate and National Women's Soccer League. Welcome to New Zealand, Cindy. Thank you. Glad to be here. Well, welcome to Equalize, all of you. And I'm going to go back to the beginning because I'm interested to know how your upbringing shaped you into the leader you are and to, to really rise to the top. So, Naomi. Yeah, I guess it was a bit of a mixed bag, which is often true for entrepreneurs. So um, my mother could do anything. She was magnificent. She's Tongan. She would cut the grass with a machete. She would cook like an angel. She could sing. She played sports. She was like that, that, that lady. My father, unfortunately, had a bad alcohol problem. Um, so quite abusive um, and negative. And our life was tough, poor, very poor. Um, but both of those things have shaped who I've become. And uh, the biggest driver for me in my whole life is that, that my mother, who has passed away, is sitting on my shoulder and that I can turn around and say, Mum, did you like me today? Oh, I think she would love you today and the impact that you've had on so many people's lives, not only in New Zealand, but globally as well. Alexia, I'm going to go to you. Um, how has your upbringing shaped you into a glass ceiling breaker? Yeah, absolutely. It, it's, I really feel so grateful to, for all of those experiences that have made me who I am today. But I think, you know, the defining moment for me was actually when I was 16 and in high school, and I was the only girl in my digital technology class and later the only girl in my advanced physics class. And I would go to coding competitions and science competitions and regularly be one of two, three young women in the room. And I just wondered, you know, why when I know my female friends are so intelligent and so capable, were they not going into these fields? And so really spurred by that feeling of isolation... I started Girl Boss New Zealand. And so, yeah, I think if I hadn't, um, which is now New Zealand's largest organisation for young women. So I think if I hadn't had those feelings of isolation and a feeling of someone's got to do something about this, then, yeah, I wouldn't be where I am today. Cindy, to you in the, in the States, what's shaped you into the leader you are? This is a voluntary role for US soccer, but you've done lots with your life. How did your upbringing influence who you are? Yeah, I think in a lot of ways. Um, so I have three brothers. So first, right off the bat, I grew up in a room full of guys. So I'm used to going into a room filled with men and, and being able to be truly myself. Um, I also grew, grew up with parents who believed that I could do anything or be anyone that I wanted to be. Um, and then I made my way onto the U.S. Women's National Team at the age of 17 
and quite literally learn from some of the best leaders in the world, in Mia Hamm, Julie Foudy, Carla Overbet, Joy Fawcett, Christine Lilly. So some of the greats of the game, like I was 17 years old um, on this team. And so just really watching and learning from them um, because up until that point, I'd never been around really true female leaders, and they all led in different ways. And I was kind of a quiet, shy kid. Um, and so I just had the opportunity to observe some of the best leaders in the world, and they all led in different ways, and they were all truly authentically themselves, which I thought was really cool. Um, and so I, it allowed me to really think and, and think about what type of leader am I going to be and how am I going to present myself to the world and stay true to who I am. And so I, I think all of those things mixed together have really helped me be the person and the leader I am today. Um, and as you know, sport helps as well, right? Um, all the leadership skills you learn, life skills you learn, I think um, through sport um, has really helped shape me. And, and did you have some good battles in the backyard with your brothers in the football? Oh, yeah. They, they stake claim um, for the reason why I've been successful in the field, because they beat the crap out of me all the time. So, <laughs> fair, fair call. I've got brothers of similar life, actually. <laughs> so, Naomi, I, m- I mentioned about the successful sale of Partners Life, and I, and I mentioned that because I think that's to be celebrated. 11 figures, but what would you consider your, your biggest glass ceiling breaking moment? Uh, I mean, I, I first joined a board of directors when I was in my very early 30s. And I joined a board of directors full of old men um, who'd been around a long time, old white men, uh, who'd been around in business for a long time. And they were recycled, you know, onto boards all the time. That was what you were expected to be as a director. And they did not like having me on the board. Um, and I recall a moment in time that changed my life completely. In life insurance, you have actuaries that do all the numbers. And the actuary would come in and he'd do a presentation and everyone would nod, smoking their cigars and guffawing. And I'd be sitting there going, asking questions. And I got told, if you don't understand this young lady, you shouldn't be on this board. So I thought, oh gosh, I better go and understand it. So I sat with the actuary and asked him what he meant when he said all these things, and he was so delighted that someone cared, and so he explained it all. And I very quickly learned none of the men sitting around that table in the board understood a thing that he was saying. And it changed my life because I went, first of all, you can learn anything if you want to badly enough, and most people don't know what they think they know, and there's power in that. And it changed my view on what I could be immediately. Yeah. Alexia, what do you think your biggest glass ceiling moment is? I think my biggest glass ceiling moment was actually when I was in year 12, so I was around 16, and I just won a nationwide coding competition. And so this was a really exciting moment for me. I was in year 12, I'd just won this big coding competition. Everything I dreamed about since I was young was laid out before me. And the next day, I walked into my technology class at my co-ed school, and my proud tech teacher announced the news to the boys in my class. Now, because I was feeling pretty cool, I was expecting a bit of fanfare, to be honest. You know, perhaps a standing ovation as I walked into the room. Perhaps my computer would be engraved in my honor, Alexia coded here. You know, just sort of the (laughs) standard fanfare I was expecting. But instead, I got a completely different reaction. You only won because you're a girl. They probably just wanted you for the promotional ads. I thought that was quite the compliment, actually. (laughs) Girls' brains are smaller than boys' brains. It's been scientifically proven, and that's why they're not in tech. Yes, really, all the way back in 2015. And so, you know, experiencing these comments... uh, was really a a breaking point for me. And I started to wonder, are there other young women like me sitting alone in classrooms across New Zealand? And they say injustice is a great place for resolve to take hold. So spurred by that feeling and then justice off it, it really was that moment that I decided that someone's got to do something about this. And you did. (laughs) 
Uh, tell us a bit about Girl Boss and, what, and the, some of the mahi, the work that you're doing around empowering young women into STEM. Yeah, well, I remember very distinctively Googling, you know, like young woman network, like, you know, ambitious young woman network, woman in STEM network, because I was quite keen just to join someone else's network. I felt like that would have been a lot easier. <laughs> but, you know, spurred by the words of Emma Watson, who said, if not me, then who? And if not now, then when? Uh, I established Girlboss at 16. Now, fast forward around eight years later, we're New Zealand's largest organisation for young women. Uh, and we run programs in over 100 high schools all around getting young women into STEM leadership and business and changing some of these stats. Awesome. I love it. Cindy, what about you? As uh, president of USA Soccer, what, what do you think your biggest glass ceiling breaking moment has been? Yeah, well, I kind of became president by accident. <laughs> um, so the vice president spot was open and I really wanted an athlete to run for that position because I thought it was really important for an athlete to be in the room when, when important decisions were being made about our sport. And um, so I tried to get some of my friends that I'd played with to run um, and no one was ending up running. So I was like, fine, I'll do it. <laughs> Um, it wasn't really in the cards for me. I just had my son, and so like I wasn't looking to run for vice president. Um, but I, I, I felt pretty strongly about it and that it was important for our game. And so I ran, I won the election, um, and then a year later, the president resigns. So quite literally, I go from trying to get someone to run from VP um, to a year later um, being president. Um, and then having to get reelected the next two years in a row because of how our governance works. So now I'm in a four-year term. Um, but for me, it, it was a great moment because it's the first time anyone, any of our former players for our national teams has been president. It's the first female as president. Um, and, you know, I thought coming in as president... You know, I'm all for equal pay. Um, I think most, there's a lot of Americans in here are well aware of the equal pay fight that we were in. Um, and having been a part of that fight for over two decades, um, I came in as president and I'm like, I'm gonna solve this. Um, and it still took me two years to resolve it. And so um, it was just such a fantastic moment to reach equal pay. Um, the moment itself was important, but what was even more important to me um, was how many people came together to actually make that happen. Um, there, are, there are probably around 100 people just on U.S. soccer's team, plus our women's national team, our men's national team, and their player associations, so their unions, all coming together to make that happen. So... Um, Pick your moment, I don't know. <laughs> because, I still have yeah. a hammer, yeah, so yeah. let me know where the next glass ceiling is. The gender insurance gap is yeah. a long-standing issue. Yeah. Uh, you know, life insurance, income protection. Yeah. You know, how have your partner's life tried to empower wahine around this, this issue? Yeah, that's a big issue, and there's a, so there's a lot of things that you have to do. And one of the things that Partners Life has done is make it much easier for women to be successful advisors um, in the marketplace, so to actually have access to women to give you advice um, around insurances. Um, we also sponsor Banker, which Kendall Flutie started, which is about financial education in high schools. And we write the insurance piece for that piece to teach kids what risk is uh, and what insurance is. So, because families don't talk about it. My family never had insurance. I didn't even know what it was when I landed in the industry. And I suspect it's not that much better now that families don't talk about it. So, having it taught in schools and giving kids the words to ask about it and to understand it is another hugely important part of that. So girls get that message at the same time as boys. Um, and I think those two things collectively, also we employ lots of females. So when you talk to anybody at Partners Life, there's more than a 50% chance it'll be a female. When you talk to a manager, there'll be a female. You know, our executive team is 50% female, our board has. So actually anybody who talks to you about Partners Life, you're just as likely for it to be a female, no matter what level. So in a way, it lessens the, the barrier to people feeling comfortable that insurance is something that women should think about and do something about. Now, Alexia, being so young and in such 
an important influential role. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, give us an example of some of the challenges that you have faced? I know the boys in your class, I mean, I, I think they'll be looking back at you and, and regretting some of those words, but uh, what about some of the challenges you've faced? I think the biggest challenges that I've faced has actually been really internal, those feelings of self-doubt, those feelings of imposter syndrome, the feelings of, you know, when I walk into a room, I'm often uh, one of the only women in the room. Uh, in a meeting, I might be, I'm almost always the youngest person there. And so really having that confidence in your value and in your worth, so you know, I do have something to share. I do have value in my words, and that is important that I speak. And the key way that I've really managed to overcome that fear is tapping into my why and tapping into what's important for me. And it's something that you have to constantly remind yourself of. Uh, just the other day, I got a phone call asking me to go um, on, on, on the breakfast show and talk about gender equality. And, you know, you sort of get these phone calls and they call you up and they say, you know, Alexia, do you want to come in six in the morning, drive across town and sit in a green room and then go on national television? You, you know, you really want to do it. And to be honest, your first thought is, uh, not really. You know, what I'd rather do is just sort of go back to bed. You know, that's, that, that's preferable. And, but what, you know, in those moments, uh, what I remind myself of, and in fact, actually what my mum always reminds me of is, you can't complain about the lack of female role models if you refuse to be one. And so when you're putting yourself out there and you're putting yourself in these uncomfortable positions, you're not doing it necessarily because it's going to feel so amazing, you're going to have the best time, but you're doing it because you believe in what you have to give. And because when you want someone, when they turn on TV and they're eating their cereal and watching the breakfast show, they can see someone like themselves speaking uh, and sharing their perspective. So, you know, tap into that why and tap into what is going to keep driving you through those moments. Cindy, you've got a lot of things on your plate, like a lot of, um, like a lot of people here, but you live in North Carolina, USA Soccer's in, based in Chicago, you've got your own full-time job, as well as the presidency, family life. How do you manage it all? I don't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they don't fly in formation? <laughs> Yeah, my five-year-old doesn't fly in formation, imagine that. I, I hear you, trust me. <laughs> no, I mean, it is a balance. Um, my husband was just here, but I think he walked off with my five-year-old. My husband is amazing, so that um, it has been so helpful and really allowed me to do what I'm doing for U.S. soccer, because it is a volunteer role. Um, and, you know... I don't know that I reached the right balance, but one thing that I've really focused on is wherever I am, I'm focused on that. So when I'm with my family, I'm 100% with my family. I'm not checking my phone. Um, when I'm working, I'm 100% working. I will check my phone if my family calls me. Um, so maybe I'm not giving the best example. Um, but it, it's more like I shift from one thing to the next, and I just try to be fully present wherever I am. And so um, I'm up here on this panel, so I'm trying to be fully present and, and with you all and, and, and with the audience today. And so um, I'm not saying I'm always great at it, but it's something that I'm really striving to do is um, wherever I am and whatever I'm doing, I'm 100% there. Yeah, I like that. I think it's harder with the phones these days, right? Because yeah. it's like anyone can get a hold of you at any moment. Yeah, throw them away, I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> There's lots of young rangatahi here today, young people, which is awesome. What would your advice, Naomi, be to these younger people on their leadership journey and breaking glass ceilings? Yeah, I guess it's easy to reflect when you get to the end of your life and look backwards. But the thing that I guess I'm most proud of is that I like me, that I'm content with who I've been, not what I've done or how much I've made. And, um, and so if you can focus on being the person that you wanna be uh, and not let other people make you someone else, then I think you get to the end of your life at successful. Um, <laughs> and those other things kind of take care of themselves. What about you, Alexia? 
Never be afraid to take the uncommon path. When I reflect on my journey, so many of the opportunities that I've had became possible, not because I was the most popular or because I followed the advice of Dr. Phil, but because I was never afraid to do things a little bit differently. Uh, when I told my mum at 16 that I wanted to start my very own social enterprise, she replied, why don't you go get a normal job and then you can just donate to charity. <laughs> uh, but I was really spurred by the belief that if you want opportunities that not many people get, you need to make choices that not many people make. You need to make the choice to be the most hopeful person in the room. You need to make the choice to always take that more ambitious path. And as for my mum, she now works full-time for me, so I got a bit of the last laugh there. <laughs> Both keeping in the family, <laughs> yeah, which is great. C Cindy, what would your advice to be to all these young people in the room today? I mean, I think along the same lines, one, be true to yourself. Stay who you are. Not the, I mean, always continue to try to learn and grow and to be better, but stay true to your values. Um, and the other thing I would say is enjoy the journey and learn from it, both the positives and the negatives. Um, the line to success is not straight. Um, at least it wasn't for me. Um, so I would say really live in those moments, um, both the downs and the highs, um, and learn from them. And, and keep a journal is my last thing. Um, just to, it's... It's so great to go back and look over. I kept a journal my first year on the women's national team um, was the 1996 Olympics. And it is hilarious to go back and look at what 17-year-old me wrote as I was entering into my first Olympic Games as the youngest player on the women's national team. So, I mean, I literally had a poster up at home of Mia Hamm, Julie Foudy, Carla Overbeck with all their autographs um, at my parents' house at home. So, um, and then I was playing with them. So it's really kind of like, but as you, as you see your growth, it's cool to keep a journal and it, it can be whatever you want your journal to be. It doesn't have to be anything fancy or crazy, um, but I've really enjoyed going back and um, kind of having a document of my journey through the years. Yeah. Well, that's a fitting way to... To close out this panel, uh, thank you so much, Naomi, Alexia and Cindy, for your insights today, but in particular, the mahi that you have done and the work that you have done to not only inspire and empower us, but for the many ripples of your work. Uh, you are truly glass ceiling breakers.